Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to start with the United session. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to call all the panelists on stage. We have Dr. Vishali, Mit Khosla, Dr. Ale Banker, uh, Moktam, we're in our presence, and we have Dr. Manisha Agarwal. So, uh, can I request Dr. Chitra Ramamurthy, ma'am, to uh, come and give a talk on cataract in uveitis patients? Correction from my side, I think the topic's now uh, uveitic glaucoma, a roller coaster ride. A very good morning to one and all of you. My uh, very, very special thanks to VRSI and all the moderators on the uh, skies for giving this uh, amazing opportunity to address you all. So my due in the next very few minutes is to take you on to this particular case of UAD glaucoma, which was truly a roller coaster ride, and I truly need to learn from your audience. We are all very clear that in uveitic glaucoma, the presentation could be an open angle with its various manifestations or a closed angle glaucoma, but also it could suddenly shift into a hypotony, which is could be because of the cyclitis or the excess prostaglandin release and increased uveal outflow. And then we also know that uh, IOP hike is more in pan uveitis and anterior uveitis, more particularly in Fuchs, GIA, poshner schwarzman syndrome, herpetic and VKH. And what happens is when you look at the OCT during the time of inflammation, the RNFL fibers look thicker, which makes you believe that the glaucoma has not well affected. But it's only in the quiescence when the RNFL becomes thinner do you realize that the glaucoma is quite advanced. So OCT is not very helpful in judging UIT glaucoma at that point. And of course, the repeated beating of the cornea because of the IOP could make it cloudy and difficult angle assessment. We also know that if you do a gonioscopy, you can easily identify the open angle to the closed angle, the pattern of iris, the iris atrophic patches, the distribution of pigments, all of which would tell us little more on the etiology of these diseases. But what is most important, we still all of us know, is the management strategy, absolute bang on inflammation control. We need to watch out an NSAIDs because they are not only not very effective, but work against bramodinin and prostaglandin. And of course, immunomodulators come in as steroid sparing, aqua suppressants are needed on and off, yak PI, multiple yak PIs are indicated. There is this controversy of prostaglandin, but again, unless it's a very active inflammation, prostaglandins do have a role in UIT glaucoma because of the kind of IOP control and yes, surgery, again, its own uh, patch of uh, controversies like TRAP, we all know is the first choice, but inflammation has to be controlled, cataract progression can occur, Combined surgery makes more sense, but we need to expect the transit hypotony and high failure rates are there, whereas in tube, especially if it's a collapsed anterior segment, you could place it in the sulcus or the pars plana, and although a good initial success, failure rates are there. And this particular study tells us that initially, apparently, these may look good, but long term, the success is just about 50-60%, whether you do a tube or a trabeculectomy surgery, and more importantly, the etiology of vision loss is not just cataract or glaucoma, it could be a BSK, a retinal pathology or more. We could get away a little bit with trabeculectomy with tight initial closure because hypotony is a challenge, the right proportion of anti-metabolites, subconjunctival injection, intense topical steroids, cycloplegics, and of course, in K needed cases, systemic steroids and immunomodulators. And then comes my case because what was happening here, it was all hypotony was alternating with high IOP and the cycle is still going on. This was a 66 year old with normal corneal thickness. The baseline IOP was little higher with medication and advanced cupping was there. Narrow angles were there, YAG PI was done. There was a history of the patient having been treated for uveitis multiple occasions elsewhere, came back with nil flare and the systemic workup was NAD and the vision was 636 and counting fingers one meter. The specular microscopy showed that the specular count was worse in right eye as against left eye and the angle entry was quite narrow in both these eyes. 
So then we decided and took a call, quite, I was quiescent, we did a trab in both eyes at an interval of two months, used Viscoat for the right eye, did the, give enough of uh, subcongenital steroids, mitomycin, surgery was uneventful, releasable sutures, everything was done appropriately and what we noticed was there was a huge spike of IOP going up, suddenly IOP going down, it was just kept beating around. But again, there was no cyclose, the dialysis cleft, due to persistent hypotony stayed in spite of uh, fluprid and other medication. There were times where the choroid became very thick with topical and oral steroids. The choroid became better, the cornea became better, the vision became better. But again, within two weeks, the IOP would go shoot up. And with the repeated occurrences, we even had to do a DSEC at one point of time but the bleb was flat as you can see. So if the patient was on stronger topical steroids, the IOP would go up. The minute we would taper up, it would go into hypotony and it was an absolutely unmanageable situation. So then the reasonings were there was no cyclodialysis cleft. There was only minimal flare during hypotony. So you don't expect a rampant cyclitis. There was no bleb leak. Graft failure was expe expected because of the complete closing up of the angle. But this is how the cornea looked at the end of it in the right eye with advanced glaucoma in the left eye. So the possible reasonings could be, I'm concluding, it could be recurrent cyclitis or uveitis or could it be mitomycin because we had space or mitomycin sponge subsclerally, could it have been toxic to the ciliary epithelium, was the patient a steroid responder but then what explains the hypotony? Of course, endothelium was compromised already and the super angle closure. So should we have done a stage surgery? Should we have done a cataract surgery alone and medically managed? management? Should we have used a valve glaucoma device? Should we have been more selective? Should have been a better inflammation control? Should we have used sustained release? Should we have used a valve GDD? So these are the questions. The last is should we have spaced our surgeries? Systemic workup was NAD. What else could we have done? Could we have avoided an MMC is the final question I have to this expert panel here. Thank you. Both uh, that excellent and challenging case. I'm going to straight dive into it and pose, pose the first question, Dr. Amit. Kin to uveitic cataracts, which you know it's recommended that we need good control, then you would want to you know get the cataract out. In uveitic glaucoma, do you recommend the same, sir, or will the IOP decide or any other factors? This control must prior to uveitic glaucoma surgical intervention or not? Question I want to ask. No, because uh, the corneal endothelium was already 1000 and odd. Because of the repeated hikes of IOP, the endothelium cornea became. Uh, so we had to uh, try everything to salvage the eye. In the moment when the eye was quiet and everything was all right, the pressures appeared to be in the normal side. We went ahead and uh, did a DSEC. We didn't do a repeat DSEC because by the time the whole angle had got zipped up. So pointless. But thankfully, the left eye also is having episodes, but not so frequent. There are periods of apparent control, but still we are having uh, that kind of uh, hypotony versus IOP and the very present. Is bilateral, bilateral, you can see uveitis also yeah. causing enterocolitis. So but you there was no evidence of, uh, of, a, of on a, the cornea of any character uveitis. Normally in glaucoma, we would want to control of inflammation. If it's controlled, then trab would work. Uncontrolled emergency, then a shunt would be better. Trap would trap tend to fail much more die. And would like to add immunosuppressive before because a short course of steroid may not control the uveitis. I prefer to add immunosuppressive and wait for a month, put the patient on Dimox, then get a control, and then maybe delay the surgery by a month or two. Now, sir, and just one last question. So, uh, would you, what's your take on mitomycin C uh, in these eyes with trap, uh, similar to uh, non uveitic eyes or? Uh, how would you we go? have a higher failure rate in uveitis, mitomycin C indicated. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to pose the second question to ma'am. So, any uh, pointers or uh, tips and tricks in, uh, let's say, doing an iridectomy uh, in, you know, uveitis in secondary angle closure with Iris Bombay, as opposed to a, uh, a regular acute, uh, you know, ACG primary angle cl uh, closure uh, patient? I think one thing is whenever we are doing any intervention in uveitis, we don't let the sample go waste. Like this one, uh, he did have uh, pigmented KPs and like Amit, I think the chances of viral are extremely high and looking at the codes. So whenever we are doing either cataract surgery, aqueous tap, if you remove the button, the similarly for iridectomy, Laser iridotomy has no role in uveitis and should not be tried. 
In fact, it induces much more inflammation and closes very soon. And you have to use a higher energy. He didn't do it. It was no, done no, elsewhere. No, no, no. He's yeah. asked me the question. So if you are planning a iridectomy for iris pombe, the best is to do a generous peripheral iridectomy and get the sample tested for all the PCRs, histopathology, and whatever your differential is so that it becomes a more of a diagnostic thing as well. I would like to next question to Dr. Uh, uh, let's say uh, this patient had, as, as ma'am pointed out in the title, had a roller coaster ride, had ups and downs, pressure was high, post-surgery pressure was low. So, uh, let's say the patient had come not with uveitic glaucoma, but with uveitic hypotony. How would you have kind of gone about first investigating and then broadly maybe managing the I think uh, what we need to understand that when a patient is having a very prolonged inflammation, hypotony primarily would be because of a compromised functioning of the ciliary processes. And uh, I think before doing any intervention in such cases, it will be imperative to control the inflammation with all means available to us. And like Dr. Amit mentioned that I think immunosuppressant had a very important role to play. So here apparently we were focusing more on just controlling the IOP with an underlying ongoing inflammation and that's why whenever there was a cessation of the steroids there was a hypotony because the ciliary processes were not functioning so i would probably would have gone about saying or managing this patient where a very long-term control of inflammation and subsequent to that having a surgical intervention for iop um, and uh, one question to dr ali uh, any uh, any choice, so uh, ma'am touched, uh, touched upon prostaglandin analogs and the controversial role if, if there is one in uveitic eyes. Any uh, issues in your mind with bremonidine, given that there have been, been reports of, uh, you know, bremonidine-induced uh, granulomatous uveitis or, uh, you know, in these eyes, would you be circumspect of that? Or what would be your threshold for suspecting, let's say, a worsening of inflammation by drugs which you're giving, uh, let's say, particularly for glaucoma, sir, in eyes? So oh, I have discussed this issue with my glaucoma specialist. I think they are pretty comfortable in using them in you know, cases where it is required. Of course, we keep a very close watch. And in my personal experience, I have not found any major issues with the use of bimonidine. I'm sure it's not going to be a long-term use, but you might have to use it for a short term till you bring down the pressures and then switch over to other anti. Just that, more for my understanding, there was no flare at any point of time, even during hypotony, if there was some kind of a flare and uh, inflammation because of the hypotony, you know there's cyclitis. So there's something there, but there was no snow banking or anything in the past planar. But there is cyclitis. Probably only that yeah. explains it. Many a times when you do a white field fluorescein angiography patient, you will find the leakage from the capillary, which may not be very evident to you when you do slit lamp examination. And in presence of the kind of the cornea you had, you know, yeah. it was a bad cornea, yeah. uh, some inflammation could be missed, especially a subtle flare, because you did have low specular count and you did have pigmented KPs and you had a bad course. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's difficult to believe that the eye was quiet. So maybe it just could not be missed. assessed. So laser flare meter, and uh, wide field optos for looking at capillaritis would give the clue. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, you ma'am. I, th I think to sum up quickly, before we go on to Dr. Ali's talk, uh, I think one must strongly consider all viral etiologies. There's any way that one is planning to enter the eye for whatever sample or a surgical iridectomy, it's imperative to send that sample and get it tested for CMV, HSV, VZV. And, um, you know, with endotheliitis, especially low, you know, specular counts of the endothelium, I think it's all the more important to look at CMV and, you know, with pigmented KPs because undiagnosed and with steroids being given le left, right, center, without ruling out an infective viral etiology, the, you know, prognosis can be extremely poor with even loss of the eye. Um, I'm going to request now, Dr. Ale, we have three talks uh, kind of straddling the issue of ARN and ARN-related retinal detachments. We're going to have Dr. Ale's talk followed by Dr. Navneet and then Dr. Mudit Tyagi and have a consolidated discussion at the end. So, Dr. Ali, please. Thank you, Mohit, and thank you, Dr. Manisha and the UITS Society and VRSI for this opportunity. 
Uh, as you all know, the retinal detachment, uh, I'll be mainly speaking on CMV retinitis as we have the other speakers concentrating on ARN. Now coming to CMV retinal detachments, these detachments have a very unique characteristic. And we all know that in CMV, when there is a larger peripheral uh, retinal area involved, this increases the risk of a CMV. What is peculiar in CMV, it is associated with you know, multiple hundreds of micro holes in the diffuse necrotic retina which occurs in a CMV. Uh, initially, there was a school of thought that if you have a small peripheral RD, you can wall off with the laser, sort of do a prophylactic laser, but in my experience, in most cases, it does not work and you have to do a vitrectomy. So what I advocate is a very aggressive approach to repair these detachments, even in the presence of very, very minimal fluid and usually primary vitrectomy with the high viscosity silicon oil and a good uh, endolaser barrage is the treatment of choice. Uh, the use of additional scleral buckle is uh, controversial and most of us have stopped using it. So just to show you a few videos to make my point through, this is different types. This is a case where you have a detachment in presence of acute CMV retinitis. Uh, you can see how cheesy the vitreous is. This is not like a normal vitreous that you see your normal patients. So you have to be extremely careful. Uh, don't do your normal style vitrectomy. You don't have to try to induce the PVD that you usually do in your normal vitrectomies. Uh, just go over the necrotic retina and try to remove as much as vitreous as possible. And then the air fluid exchange is essentially very simple because there are multiple holes. And with a flute needle, you can finish your air fluid exchange. And after you have settled the retina, I usually give in an intravitreal antiviral agent in the operating room after you finish the fluid gas exchange, which is followed by the silicon oil injection. Now, as opposed to that, this is a RD in a healed CMV retinitis. And here, the vitreous is very different. You can see the vitreous in a healed CMV case. It's usually in the form of sheets, uh, more so in patients who are on long-term antiretroviral therapy. And here also you have to be extremely careful, particularly at the junction of the necrosed and the healed retina. And this is the area where most of the holes appear. And you have to be extremely careful in trimming the vitreous. Don't try to pull it. Just trim the vitreous at the edges. And once you've trimmed, you can just you know, perform the routine vitrectomy, fluid gas exchange, and a good two, three layers posterior laser the area of the necrotic and the normal retina. Uh, this is just to show you an example, the uh, below photographs. Uh, I usually like to leave this high viscosity silicon oil unless it emulsifies. And I have many cases, one-eyed cases. This is the photograph of a one-eyed case who is an oil-filled eye after seven years. And the top photograph shows the active CMV in presence of oil where we injected. Uh, it was a bubble and then you rupture and the retinitis heals. Uh, coming to ARN, uh, just to show you a few pre and the post of examples, again in ARN cases, acute retinal necrosis cases, you should be very, very aggressive. Actually, the teaching now is going in terms of doing a so-called prophylactic vitrectomy. As soon as you see severe vitritis in cases of ARN, once you have attained a reasonable uh, healing of the retinitis, people usually go in for a so-called prophylactic vitrectomy with a high viscosity silicon oil. And you can see this one case where presented with uh, acute retinitis, we gave an intravitreal sedofovir, and then we did the surgery with high viscosity silicon oil, and you can see this fundus photos. Very rarely, you can have very severe cases. This was one-eyed. Uh, you can see this is the only remaining retina in this patient. And I like to use the Tano's diamond dusted forceps to remove the membranes. You gently scrap off the membranes of the surface of the retina. You can see the micro holes. So it's just a posterior retina which is viable. And easily you can attach the retina. And this patient is now into 10 years of follow up with the oil in place, 5000 centistock oil, and has 660 vision. You can have good ambulatory vision. And in most cases, even after this oil emulsifies, I usually tell these patients that we are just going to replace the oil. We are never going to have your eye without any oil because they are definitely going to redetach if you remove the oil. 
So to summarize the CMV as well as the acute retinal necrosis related retinal detachments have a very unique characteristic and you cannot do your conventional techniques. Uh, early aggressive vitrectomy with the use of high viscosity silicon oil. Uh, always try to have the oil in place, remove and replace the oil whenever it emulsifies. And most important as in all uveitis, even before and after the surgery, you should have a very strict control of the infectious disease and the systemic therapy to be prolonged. Most of these cases eventually end up with early cataract surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you for that great talk. As, uh, as discussed earlier, we're going to take uh, you know, the discussion and talks after all three talks. Uh, with that, I invite Dr. Nivneet. He's going to be talking on vitrectomy for retinal detachment in acute retinal necrosis. Dr. Nivneet. And I also request Dr. Mudit when it's about a minute left for Dr. Navneet's talk to be here for his talk. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Vera Sai to give the opportunity to present. Uh, I am showing a single case uh, of uh, acute retinal necrosis. This is a, a young patient uh, with the retinal detachment. Uh, he was seropositive and also multi drug resistant tuberculosis. Uh, he had decreased vision for last two months, but there was a sudden decrease in vision uh, around uh, eight to ten days back. The picture: this was pale, the roast vessel. Other eye was pale negative. Uh, then was uh, uh, PL plus PR accurate. So I just show the unedited video uh, of this case. Uh, just to show what all steps I fo followed. I didn't put the buckle as discussed by sir also like uh, currently we don't practice because all the peripheral retina is all necrotic. So we don't prefer putting a buckle anymore. Uh, we can see that how the vitreous was. We just try to see if there is any attachment to the disc of the uh, but uh, it was only attached to the periphery. Uh, at times uh, at places we can see that uh, uh, all this uh, vitreous is firmly attached to the vitreous base only and uh, uh, we also put then uh, triumphalone just to check there is no left vitreous because uh, as uh, this uh, described by sir also like in these cases the vitreous is firmly adhered to the retina as in this area we can see it was firmly adherent and as we just went there and touched there was a uh, there was all this uh, peripheral retina was necrotic uh, was uh, this was an area in which we could see there was still a, an attached vitreous bus. But we always, uh, there may be a difference in opinion, different in uh, difference uh, in surgical steps at times. Like uh, we prefer to remove uh, ILM in all these cases because just to ensure that uh, uh, there is all vitreous removal is there. Uh, we do with the contact lens. Uh, this is uh, our uh, magnifying lens and uh, con uh, direct magnifying lens. And uh, as we can see, there is still uh, attached vitreous in the at the macular area. And as we even try to uh, put the ILM at places, it is a bit firmly attached. It is not a normal ILM what we uh, do in all other cases of detachments or macular hole. Uh, but it is a bit firmly kind of attached as we see uh, when we are pulling it. Uh, uh, a tight kind of adhesion what we see. So uh, in these cases even uh, we prefer to uh, stain again so that uh, we have a better view because there is always a membrane over it. We first remove that membrane. So uh, first I tried to remove it as much as possible then went again inside and uh, uh, stained the ILM. This is again the staining of the ILM and uh, now we can see like uh, it is better stained and uh, we could find the margin easily and then uh, uh, could remove it. But somehow we could find, we could see like it is compared to the normal detachments, it is a bit firmly attached. Uh, but uh, after removing the overlying vitreous, it came out easy. After re staining, because I think there was a vitreous membrane over it, so it, first time it, uh, it didn't take the stain well. Uh, this was like uh, then we followed up with the fluid air exchange and there was all the peripheral area was necrotic so uh, we could easily drain from uh, the hydrogenic break uh, uh, which was uh, in the nasal side and also other uh, 
uh, all those uh, peripheral necrotic area. For all the necrotic area from where also, uh, from where we just went inside and trained the subretinal fluid. Then we went ahead with the uh, laser. We do, uh, as discussed, like uh, two, three rows of laser uh, behind the necrotic retina, uh, only sparing the posterior pole. We follow the uh, in use of uh, normal silicon oil. Yes, uh, uh, we keep it for a longer time. And as discussed, like uh, uh, whenever we plan to remove it, just we put it back again uh, because of the very high incidence of hypotony in these eyes. So this was what like we do multiple rows of lasers uh, uh, behind the necrotic retina and uh, close it with silicon oil. This was how it was uh, after three months. Now we have at least eight months follow up of this patient and uh, uh, patient could gain uh, up to 618 uh, vision and this was uh, the white field photograph. Thank you. Dr. Navneet, and uh, now I'll request Dr. Mudit. He's going to be speaking on retinal detachment in NAN. Uh, and after this, we'll have the discussion. Mudit, please. So much thank you to USI and to Vinay for giving me a chance to talk on retinal detachments in Karen. And also, I would be kind of reiterating some of the points made by the earlier speakers. We know that detachments com complicated by proliferative retinopathies can occur in around 40 to 60 percent of patients with ARN over a period of time. And unlike a simple ragmatogenous detachment that we see otherwise, these detachments have got a ragmatogenous as well as sometimes even a tractional component. Now, when you look at surgeries in ARN, they have got their own different set of challenges and some peculiarities which are basically pertinent only to RDs in ARN. So, we'll be discussing some of them. The first thing is, lot of times you may come up with a condition where you also have a pre-existing retinitis which is still active and those are the times when this can be tricky because inducing PVD in these eyes in itself can lead to a lot of breaks subsequently. Apart from that we have already seen in the earlier two videos that there are abnormal vitreous adhesions and let me just show you a few of them. So This was a patient and what you can see behind this is a thick sheet of vitreous that you are seeing over here and this is how somehow the vitreous in ARN eyes is what I am saying. So if you look at it, you can see these extensive additions over here of this vitreous over here. And you have to be very careful when you are trimming them and cutting them because if you try to pull upon them too much or try to force too much of a PV induction, you will end up creating more of hydrogenic breaks. This is what I am saying. So what you go and you have seen in the previous videos also, that's what you need to do. You need to go and carefully trim them to as much of a possible extent as you can. So that is what you do. You go ahead, go and trim all of these peripheral extensive vitreous additions. Second, next point is a necrotic retina. So, lot of the times why we get a detachment in ARN is because the peripheral retina is extremely necrotic. And that is how it will be if you look over here, you see this extensive sieve like retina. What you see is this, this entire retina in the periphery has got multiple breaks and this looks like a sieve with multiple areas of breaks all around. Next comes ERM. Now already Navni showed you the idea where they do an ILM peeling that helps actually a lot. But even otherwise if you look at it this is how some of the OCTs are where you see these thick ERMs which are causing attraction upon the retina. And you have to be very careful in dissecting them. So you go around slowly carefully removing all of those membranes. And it is also important to try to as meticulously remove these membranes because this is one of the most common reasons for a failure or a recurrence of your ARNRDs. You will see a lot of times patient will come back with a very shallow detachment as a recurrence and the reason is that there will be a thick or left behind sheet of an ERM which will be causing attraction upon the retina leading to a detachment recurrence over here. I don't know why this is So this is what I'm saying. So this was the same patient who had this thick ERM and you have to go around carefully dissecting it. In fact, in the process of removing this entire sheet of ERM, we also created one small iatrogenic break. But thankfully that was already in the area of the necrotic retina. That did not end up troubling us that much. 
but you have to go around dissecting as much of this membrane as possible because if you leave it behind it will come back and lead to a recurrence subsequently in terms of how you do a laser i think this is always shown it's important to remember that you do a laser in the area of the healthy retina and you try to demarcate the healthy from the unhealthy retina and in most of these cases we end up doing an entire 360 degree laser in the healthy retina so as to wall it off completely from the area where there was an abnormal necrotic peripheral retina so this was how this patient was preoperatively and this is how the patient became postoperatively and maintained a vision of 2080 so the points which i would just like to reiterate are the detachments in these cases are different from simple regmatogenous rds vitrectomy as has been already mentioned is preferred over a buckling because of the fact that you already have an extensive necrotic peripheral retina in vitreous additions necrotic retina and thick erms need to be addressed if you want to basically avoid recurrences in these eyes if i can just make one last point in terms of the use of silicon oil while we do in most cases prefer using a 5000 cm stroke oil because you will need to keep these eyes under a long term tamponade sometimes we get lucky and we see ar and rd is localized to only one quadrant and two quadrants with not an extensive peripheral traction and not extensive peripheral membranes and in those eyes we can probably just get away with using a 1000 cm stroke oil and remove it even 3 months or 4 months later those are a minority but even those cases do sometimes come to us but in most cases we do end up keeping them under a long term tamponade thank you so much thank you thank you dr murit excellent videos and thank you for being on time uh validated about 20 21 minutes of discussion time and before we go into uh, i think the pmv and rnr discussion there was one question in the chat box from the audience i think this is pertaining to the case that dr chitra did cast that and and it goes like this that he will be doing cataract surgery when inflammation is very well controlled as was discussed last time and uh, so in active eye does pcr have a good posit positivity rate in detecting of viral dna dash rna what do you want to that guessing what the question uh, what they're trying to ask is we are recommending control prior to doing cataract surgery in juvetic eyes so uh, you know doing let's say getting access to the sample once that control is reached it still have a positivity rate of detecting the uh, you know viral uh, specifically viral dna the patient is not on an antiviral have a positive the yeah. patient is on an antiviral in the positivity will absolutely sir. for the for, for viruses i think pcr from the aquas is the way to go as far as diagnosis is coming back to the cmv and r um, so rds i'm going to and post the first question to you sir uh, uh, dr amit so uh, in your experience so th- so i believe the subset of cmv rds and r rds tend to behave a little differently i think the the setting of the patients tend to be a little more you know, uh, se- uh, tend to be different r is a more um, you know acute like a edge hammer one time event hardly any re- recurrences because either you win the battle or aunt takes the eye however cmv it's a long drawn out like from um, brain and you know russia conflict it's it's, it's going to be on for a long time and hence the rds also tend to be different so your approach sir you be clubbing both aunt and cmv retinal detachments under the same kind of umbrella and management would be similar to what's been discussed you think there are subtle nuances and difference between CMV would be two different type: the positive and the HIV negative for leukemia patients with a CMV infection. There are two different patterns. Or with heart, uh, CMV do get control if your CD ratio is above, uh, CD count is above two hundred. Need to manage the HIV option and the this. The uh, surgery is different, and you can have a uh, healed CMV having a RD later. So as he showed two videos, one is the active one. Would like to have it inactive before you take up for. Well, the on one are more aggressive and thank you uh, uh the second question to dr ale so uh, in let's say very aggressive uh, you know similar to the last case that you showed single eyed lady with very posterior almost macula encroaching heel let's say they were active or or you heel heel like in your case uh, what is your take on retinectomizing most of the retina versus uh, you know just consider just you know doing uh, what you did sir and uh, actually ensuring that both of those them are uh, not retina is not removed but you put some laser and try and ensure that it stays yeah i mean that's a very valid point so i think that will come to know once you do the fluid gas exchange you'll be able to make sure that the retina is remaining flat or it is slightly elevated and as i'd shown it's a highly necrotic retina with bridges all around 
If you see any segment which is still getting pulled up, you can just use your cutter to cut it off and sort of create the relaxing red knot. Yeah, uh, so that you have. The thing is that in most of these cases of AR and as well as CM red knot, the RD usually occurs in a stage when it is predominantly healed. Because once it has healed, it's only then that you get that peripheral necrosis leads to those multiple breaks. It will be only very few cases where you may still have one small area of activity. But predominantly the breaks occur in the area which is already healed and is necrotic. One thing which we have to remember is if you have seen a retinal detachment and I which has got an extremely active retinitis regions all around, you need to step back and think are you actually dealing with a reg RD or what you are dealing with maybe an exudative RD. If you have got an extensive like a bilateral ARN or an ARN with extensive peripheral retinitis which is still active and you see a detachment, then instead of jumping and labeling it just as a reg RD, we also need to keep in mind the fact you may be dealing with an exudative RD. Leg RDs usually occur when the lesions have predominantly all of them have healed. You have got an old necrotic retina in the periphery. Fair enough, fair enough. I think point taken. Having said that, uh, Nan, um, I make them. Cases I think have to have, or we have to be a little careful when we plan a retinectomy. Because the aim would be to salvage as much of the retina that you can. And sometimes what happens is that the necrosis is extending quite posterior. So if you land up chopping off the peripheral retina, you may realize that you don't have much area left to actually be doing this. So I, I would be having a little reservation of uh, going ahead and doing a retina cases unless there is an active traction which you are wanting to remove. I have a point. There are two scenarios. One is like Ale was showing, there is a membrane which is pulling it and uh, I would remove that at the cost of causing more breaks. I really do not care because there are thousands of breaks anyways. So if you are weighing your options of leaving that membrane, so we creating a break, I think you should remove the membrane. And then like Alice said, you do a fluid-fluid exchange or fluid air exchange and see if the retina is settling down. If it settles down, there is no need retinectomy and by and large these patients do not really be detached because they just get fixed. There is so much inflammation which probably acts as a pexy and we have a long term tamponade added to it. The problem with retinectomy is it seems very simple that the retina is sieve like anyway what why not cut it. Problem is when the edge rolls it's so much necrotic that you will have that edge Actually, after the air coming very close to the posterior pole and the fovea, and you are hardly left with any. So I think it's a good idea not to do retinectomies unless you are really pushed to the wall. Uh, so now from uh, kind of managing RDs, I think two important questions regarding prevention of RDs. You know, retinal detachment is the major issue in them. Uh, the, uh, quick, uh, if I can have a quick show of hands from the audience, anyone doing prophylactic barrage laser prevent retinal detachment in these eyes? Anybody in the audience who's show of hands? Have maybe one person. In, in ARN? In the ARN. In ARN. I think sir. it's very important to examine the other eye. And very often we see small peripheral lesions uh, which will eventually heal down the line because you've started a systemic therapy. And if you feel you can barrage that if it's a very small segment, uh, not if it's a larger area. It does, I mean, if it's a very small healed patch, then maybe you can just, if there is vitreous condensation, then I think it's worth doing barrage. But not for the eye in which we are doing the, uh, no, no, no. the primary thing with Absolutely the Absolutely not. Fair enough. Anybody uh, with any different uh, views on that? I think. A recent publication in Pina by Anita. That they have shown that uh, whether you do prophylactic laser or don't do, the results are almost the same. The percentage overall. Poorer maybe with prophylactic laser. I yeah. mean, they're actually poorer with prophylactic laser. I would do. Just a point to make. Somehow, the, the uh, post COVID, we are seeing a lot of cases of ARN. It's almost. And the bad ones. Bad ones, exactly. And the, uh, like what Mudit said, my experience is we are having so much necrosis. That they are having reg RD in the acute phase, which it was kind of a rarity uh, in the past. But now post-COVID, you know, I'll show one patient tomorrow in my talk, encephalitis he had in the past active. And within like four or five days, I wanted lesions to heal.
but the rd just kept on going mad and you saw the breaks and you had to intervene something is changing post covid and with severe vitriol and very severe hemorrhages vitriol. like we never saw so many hemorrhages something is different yeah and i was actually coming to that there's some data from the lvp and also from our group and we've published data on the on rd as uh, you know mudit has talked about typically you'd be heel lesions you'd have a pvd down the line and you know you'd have multiple sieve like breaks a, a lot of those but other subset is i'm talked about a minority but something which can't be brushed under the uh, under the carpet when the retinitis is almost as fulminant as you can get the retina rips you have active retinitis and you have a retinal detachment again a minority but a huge management challenge and the prognosis and the outcomes in the published data on that even after surgery is poor just one question sir any uh, uh, any thoughts or any experience on using antivirals in the infusion line during vitrectomy in such cases in, in which you have active retinitis retinal detachment and you're doing vitrectomy no i don't put it in infusion but as i said i always do it after with gas exchange for putting in the oil if the antiviral injection. and those reductions are similar to you would do i don't it, not, i don't not, not, not in these not in arn cases fair enough sir uh, the other point that i would like to make when uh, dr vishali said very nicely about peeling these membranes i think that's why i showed this video uh, the tanos diamond dusted forceps and the snare the finesse loop i think these are very good instruments relatively atraumatic where you can just gently scrap off the membranes you know kind of just gently shove it off then use your forceps to pull it off these two instruments they lift up the edges of the membranes very atraumatically you can use them in presence of you know fulminant rds or good points uh, regarding prophylaxis the other i won't say burning topic but something which is discussed much more now as compared to prophylactic laser prophylactic vitrectomy so you try and do vitrectomy when the media gets a little hazy you get a pvd and uh, one school of thought would say that you know you can try and prevent a retinal detachment so have anybody on the panel who has some experience with that and my and the second set the corollary to that question is so uh, if you were to you know go ahead and do a prophylactic vitrectomy let's say high risk patient one eyed or whatever and uh, you know remove the hyaloid would you go whole hog and ensure that every last bit is out and what would you do with the necrotic Uh, breaks in the periphery, which are now in the attached retina, because it's prophylactic. And would you use a tamponade even without a retinal detachment in a prophylactic vitrectomy? As I said, post COVID, I've had the opportunity to operate four cases you know, of severe fulminant vitreitis, and you see a little bit of retinal detachment appearing. Uh, in all these four cases, surprisingly, most of the time the vitreous came off very easily from the optic disc. I did not have to pull. and uh, of course i i was not very aggressive in doing a vitreous base excision but uh, i even though most of the retina was attached i still used a high viscosity 5000 viscosity silicon oil as in tampon the last one question dr shamik and then take quite a few questions from the audience and we have some time so we'll take them then uh, so this is uh, regarding your experience regarding oil choice of tamponade to which pay with 1000 or 5000 centi stroke silicon oil and uh, uh, a subset to that is what is your uh, take on and your experience on to get the oil out um i i would rather go in for the 5000 rather than doing the 1000 or 1500 and uh, probably keep it for as long as possible and we had discussions on these key will a replacement of the oil if at all rather than removing it altogether i think yeah i think good points I'm going to now take the. Uh, uh, so uh, you know this question is from Dr. Anamika, and uh, you know the, the question she's asked is, post-operative sclerotic edema in these cases, how to proceed with it if intravitreal steroids are contraindicated by the UVA clinic? I think which little the retina, but there is you know and fairly good anatomic success, but on OCT you find that there is still you know there is some CME. How to treat that in eyes with is on rd if i'm not just on but on rd so nobody else there is saying that i'll go it after so oh, had published about 15 years ago not in on but in cmv uh, even post healed cmv cases who had macular edema uh, we have publications where we have given intravitreal tramsinolone ozodex was not available that time and it has worked of course 
the only worry was the flare up of the infections but these were patients who were already on antiretroviral therapy the viral loads were extremely under control gave them intravitreal steroids the other good thing is to use uh, diflupredinate eye drops which has a very good penetration into the posterior segment and in most of these eyes uh, you know increasing ocular pressure is not going to be much of an issue because they're already slightly iops on the lower side diflupredinate is my first choice try it that if not we can give intravitreal and your take on psd cannot also before i go to Mut uh, you, I think now, uh, I don't know about the others, but I have not used posterior subtenance since almost last five to ten years. So, I don't think in viral yeah. PSD can occur. Uh, I agree, uh, topical steroids, topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, and I have tried intravitreal interferons. I can't say it's too convincing, uh, but uh, I think it's better let the sleeping dogs, you know, sleep wake them up. So if you have a flat retina, you have a quiescent, quiescent enough control of inflammation, uh, I will not be too aggressive about some macular edema which is there for start. The same point, repeat. like what Dr. Vachali has already said, I probably would not go around thinking of giving any intravitreal steroid in these eyes. These are eyes which have already had a viral infection, even if they are under the cover of an antiretroviral agent, this still is a huge risk of a reactivation of an ARN or a viral lesion. The other point is if it's a zero positive patient, you end up giving them a steroid, not only viral, but even you can have a bad toxoplasma coming in. And that can be disastrous sometimes. So I probably would, but like what sir said and ma'am said, topical diflupredinate works well. Sometimes you may have an ERM or something which may also be causing a macular edema. You can take care of that also. But intravital steroids, uh, probably no. So steroids again, no for me. Fair enough. Thank you. I think there's also uh, a couple of cases by Dr. JB and his team uh, in which they've looked at Ozodex, uh, you know, being given these. But I completely agree. I think uh, my hands would quiver uh, in uh, giving uh, intravitreal steroids in these eyes. Uh, again, just taking two more questions from the chat box, and I think we have about five minutes to go. Uh, and if I can pose the, uh, pose the next one to you, ma'am. Uh, since it's on triamcinolone, someone's asked that uh, Dr. Neharika, Will giving intravitreal triumphs in the loan few few days prior to retinal detachment help in an RD? I think one thing we have to hammer in our heads is no local steroids in viral are suspected viral. You know, there is no question of the root, no question of quiescence, just no questions, no local steroids who are in uh, next question to you, Dr. Amit. Uh, this is regarding what's the reason behind neovascularization in these cases? Uh, I'm guessing they're talking about, uh, I can ask Dr. Anamika Nath, uh, are you particularly talking about iris neovascularization, neovascularization that happens at the retinectomy edge posteriorly or anything in particular? Uh, if not, then uh, we can proceed with the question. Anamika Nath. The ischemia would be causing a neovascularization. The vasculitis which causes ischemia would be. You, so and would you be managing them any differently, sir? Would your prognosis or would your, uh, you know, uh, indication for surgery or non-surgery depend on that? Or uh... in, in a existing, the risk goes higher with the need on the table. You have to laser it at the end of surgery. Uh, Doctor, these eyes are, I think, anoxic. Okay, makes much new much new of the eye. Uh, and one last question before we go on to uh, um, talk, and this is regarding, uh, so timing of vitrectomy for ARN. Uh, so the question is, is it appropriate to operate when the retinitis is still active or wait for retinitis to heal completely? I think we, we briefly touched on that. And uh, the idea is this happens rarely. If there is a full thickness retinitis, unifocal or multifocal, and you unfortunately ran up with a retinal detachment, might want to take some time and try and get the retinitis to heal. But the idea is, you, it's not like you can operate a month later. We'll have to, the retinitis will not heal far, fast enough for you to reach a stage that the retinitis is healed and you're still in a position to operate the retinal detachment. So your hand is forced and you don't have that luxury of timing in, in, you know, in that case. Uh, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we don't have Ashish with us. We had to rush home for a, a family emergency. Ma'am's going to be presenting uh, uh, Ashish's uh, Ashish case and it's a, Laser induced exacerbation of ocular inflammation in, eye which, uh, in an eye with edges disease. Dr. Can I have the case? 
It's in Ashish's folder. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, VRSI, and I'm very happy to be presenting this case uh, on behalf of Ashish, our fellow. I will be very, very brief. Now, this is a patient of Bechet's, bilateral Bechet's, and this was seen by us, you know, almost a year ago. And you can see there is active capillaritis in both the eyes, and she had Bechet's. She was treated with IVMP, azathioprine, cyclosporin, could not afford biologics, so it was controlled. Now, this is what the course was. So, like I, uh, you know, a couple of months later, she came to us when the steroids were reduced because she was having severe complications of steroids. So, she was maintained on azathioprine and cyclosporin. As you can see, the left eye was full of multifocal retinitis. Right eye looked very good. So, we did the fluorescein angiogram. So this is the right eye. And you can look at the angiogram. There were areas, extensive areas of capillary non-perfusion. And in the late phase, there were the predominant finding was areas of capillary non-perfusion. Compared to the left eye, which had multiple retinitis lesions, and they did have the features of retinitis and areas of capillary non-perfusion, but there was extensive leak from the capillary bed, meaning the left eye was very, very active, and right eye had more of ischemic changes rather than activity. We could not give steroids because of her systemic problems, so we planned that to tide over the acute phase, we will give ozidics in the right eye and start biologics and, you know, continue with whatever immunosuppression she was on. In the right eye, I thought there were lots of areas of ischemia and, you know, let's do laser to the right eye because uh, the left eye, to me, appeared very bad. So this is the plan. This is the eye that underwent lasers, and this is what happens 48 hours later. When, like, I saw the pictures, I said, no, it was the left eye which was involved. What happened to the right eye? And the right eye, following laser photocoagulation, had a very severe inflammation, not only that, even the hypopia. So the left eye was doing fine, and, uh, you know, over a period of time, of course, with biologics and all, we managed both the eyes. I think my thing is not showing. But the take-home message is don't take laser too lightly. Don't keep on pushing laser, uh, you know, whenever you feel like, because laser itself can induce inflammation and the timing of laser photocoagulation is extremely important because you should choose it very carefully uh, once you are very sure of the complete quiescence, especially in uveitic eye, you see NVD, NVD might be simply because of the inflammation out there and not due to ischemia. So there is no rush to go ahead with laser. We burnt our fingers because I thought the eye was quiet. So that was the only reason I wanted to discuss. Thank you, Mohit. Ma'am, thank you. Thank you for that very great case and very pointed uh, kind of message from that. Before we take the discussion, can I ask Atul to be uh, to please come on the other podium and be ready? Thank you. Uh, question, Dr. Amit, sir. So in this patient, the right eye. Uh, the patient on uh, ultra wide field angiogram did not have an NVD or NVE, but had a lot of capillary dropout. And it looked like, you know, there were some RPE changes in the periphery. Uh, would you have lasered, sir? Given that the patient already was carrying a diagnosis of Bechet's disease, the other eye had very uh, florid, active, multifocal areas of retinitis. Uh, but in the absence of angiographically and clinically detectable NVD, NVE, would you have lasered or not? So with the extensive uh, capillary non-perfusion, the risk of uh, NVD, NV is high. Uh, I may have, in retrospect, lasered in multiple sittings because uh, I had a plenty of time before the NV developed. If the NV was there, I would be more aggressive. I may just give 500 spots on one sitting and call the patient again after a month and observe. So sometime in these patients who have vasculitis and active certain patch have NV, I tend to be giving more gaps than do extensive laser at one sitting. 
what would be your timing of laser, sir? Would you be, uh, so you, let's say we got the angio done today, we saw what we saw in the angio. And so would you be, let's say, doing in a week? Would you want, uh, you know, to get it out a bit, uh, wait longer for inflammation, to, uh, keeping in mind that this eye is already controlled, the other eye has active, you know, has a lot of activity. And no, I would, I would up the, what I would, what I do is that if the patient is on, say, methotrexate or azathioprine, uh, normally, we don't add mycophenolate to azathioprine, but methotrexate and mycophenolate, or you add cyclosporin. So the patient cannot afford biogicals. We tend to add two drugs. Give a very, if it's a child, give a very low 2.5 milligram steroid, control it, and then do the link. Today, with the rheumatologists, we are playing with a lot of rheumatology drugs, and we have learned that one drug tends to create more side effects. You can add two, three drugs, then try to control it. So that, uh, that way, we can uh, also control. Fair enough. Uh, one question to Dr. Alice. Uh, so your take on this, sir. Would you have done anything differently regarding choice of laser? Yes or no? And timing of laser, sir? Well, I think uh, I would have done the laser immediately post angiography and I, I would have even done it in one sitting. But as rightly said by Amit, I think most of the rheumatologists are now adding another drug. Combination drugs gives uh, better control with she, fewer side She was already on two drugs, and this was the recurrence on cyclosporine and as yeah. a hybrid. Now she's very well controlled on adalubimab. Left eye has capillary non perfusion. I'm just not <laughs> yeah, doing laser. Not doing anything. Oh. <laughs> I know, you Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, that we're going to come to uh, the Atul's talk. He's going to be speaking on managing paradoxical worsening in a patient with TBSLC when corticosteroids are contraindicated. Uh, Dr. Atul, please. Very good afternoon, everyone. I'll be presenting this interesting of paradoxical tuberculous epigenous like choroiditis for the steroid response. Let's see. Manage this. We have a 19 year old Asian Indian male present complain of decrease in his right eye for past three weeks. He gave history of having similar complaints left eye one and a half years for which he was treated outside. He was diagnosed as, as like choroiditis and with a deep uh, posterior subtenon prime syndrome with poor gain in vision. Now, at presentation, we have this right eye. Vision was 660. So we can see active choroiditis as well as involving macula, protemporal. Fuzzy uh, margin suggest are active compared to the uh, predominantly heel lesions uh, in fear relief that we can see. Autofluorescence kind of conforms the activity. Left eye, the disease was kind of burnt out with scars. The patient had glaucomatous optic neuropathy and raised intraocular pressure. So we made the diagnosis of serpiginous like choroiditis, right eye, of activity in right eye, went ahead with treatment with oral corticosteroids, and the patient was advised immunological and radiological tests to rule out tuberculosis. Uh, at follow-up at one week, the lesions were kind of stable and immunological tests were positive. So anti-tubercular therapy was added, more drug ATT, and the, while the steroids were continued. continued. Now, here, two weeks down the line, what we have? This is baseline and this is the uh, follow-up. Here we can see appearance of new lesions, protemporal quadrant as well as the patient was on ATT and steroids. So we have paradoxical worsening. Autofluorescence confirms the active lesion. So uh, in view of steroid responsiveness, we uh, went ahead with intravitreal methotrexate injection. The patient was asked to come after a week, but lesions continued to progress uh, even on receiving intravitreal methotrexate. Now, there's a problem. What are the treatment options we have? Uh, we would love to give intravital dex implant, but this uh, patient is one-eyed and steroid responder. Intravital methotrexate we have tried. IVMP or intravenous methylprednisolone is an option, but that requires admission, systemic investigation or so. If we start with immunosuppressions, they take around uh, two, three weeks to start, uh, to, for the erection to come. But we did. We went ahead with intravital adalimumab. One week following the injection, we can see that the lesions kind of have stabilized. It lesions have started healing as evidenced by the defining of the edges. And the autofluorescence confirms the same. 
the oral steroids and ATT were continued. The patient was closely monitored weekly. He, uh, there was no uh, need for further injection and the lesions started healing. And three months, you can see that the patient has very well responded to treatment. And the uh, anti-tubercular therapy was stopped after nine months. Oral steroids were gradually tapered over three months while maintenance dose was continued up till the nine months when ATT and stopped along with ATT. And we have now one and a half year follow up of this patient maintaining 660 vision and the lesions fine. This kind of sums up what uh, we had at presentation and the patient had paradoxical worsening and adalimumab kind of worked very well in this. Few words, adalimumab as we know it's a monoclonal uh, antibody directed against anti-TNF and it kind of blocks the inflammatory pathway has been tried in non-infectious uveitis. Systemic use has been very well known and even intravital efficacy and safety profile is fine for non-infectious uveitis. Uh, an important point is it's uh, infectious uveitis. We have to be cautious while using it as one of an important side effect is reactivation of tuberculosis. In our patient we gave it vocally, intravitrally as we have an immune response rather than a directed by a TB bacilli itself and as we know it was a desperate times need desperate measures so uh, we had kind of able to save this patients it was one night in case uh, we take the discussion can I request Dr. Mamta to be present on the other side for her paper thank you um, Dr. Ale the, the, the question to you sir what is your uh, go-to treatment of choice? Let's say the patient isn't a steroid responder and steroids aren't contraindicated. Tubercular SLC with paradoxical worsening, what is your go-to treatment uh, for, let's say, just one eye involvement, unilateral, sir? So recently, Manisha has taught me to use intravitreal oxyfloxacin. Uh, and I've uh, had the opportunity to use in three of my patients. I've got very, very good response. Oxyfloxacin with Avastin. Enough. Uh, Dr. Amit, your, uh, your take on the same, sir? I feel the epidural choroditis are very severe. They work, you need immunosuppression like VKH for years. We have given the ATT, they recur. That is the response to it. Even a dead buccular bacilli is creating an immune reaction. Uh, what I learned about 10 years back, there was a bank manager who came at business. We gave him steroids, gave him ATT. He for nine months. That he has been taking steroids for nine months, 60 milligrams, and ADT for nine months. He came back with 60. But taught me that it's a severe immune reaction. Sometimes I we must help Ernestlon give um, Ozodrex. The disease keeps progressing. There's one patient I think sharing with Shankar He's gone to Shankar After five months of ATT, has a recurrence. We've again asked him to start methotrex. Patient to me, in my view by a long term immunosuppression, one year, two years at time, they are, or they are varied variety, not all, they are a varied variety who require for nine months, one year, I put them on methotrexate for a year, two years. Systemic, after, systemic sir. Systemic. After. Not intra, not local sir. Local not. only add if it's uh, on tapering steroid at three months, a recurrence, I add ozodex. And, and so ozodex would be your go-to, so, so and, and uh, let's just complicate things a bit, yeah. if it's similar to what he had, so steroids are out the window now. Uh, at least local steroids are so then how would you now go about uh, you know trying to treat this patient the so, patient has is a latent tb doesn't have an active foci of tb i may add systemic ADA. i have these children who are monto positive but you say a gi or other thing give them six or two months of ADA to such either, either i have added methotrexate plus mmf if the ADA was of this i have given a Methotrexate and microfinal combined after giving ATT. In this case, I was discussing a patient who had lymph node, the pulmonologist refused to give the patient ATT. One eye had been lost, multiple tricot injection elsewhere. He had come to me at the fag end of the disease. This time he came with the right eye having this thing and with a, on a PET scan having a paratracheal lymph node. So he didn't go in for a biopsy, we gave the patient ATT. Despite the ATT, again the patient had this reaction. His patient is six months almost. But now, on methotrexate, has had ozodrex, which caused glaucoma. Still, the patient has, has borderline pressure. They have added methotrexate. 
uh, so, uh, ma'am, please, your take I on. I think there are two issues here we are discussing. One is the acute phase where there is paradoxical worsening, which typically comes you start AT and there is herish hexamer like reaction. You see it between three to five weeks of starting AT if the steroids are not given in the adequate. Now, managing the paradoxical worsening, we do not have the luxury of waiting for systemic immunosuppression because methotrexate takes six weeks to act. Azathioprine will again take about four weeks. So, the game is lost by that time. So, to manage this paradoxical worsening, we have to go very high dose steroids, which could be intravenous methyl prednisolone. And we have shown in our publication the cytokine profiling of the patients who show paradoxical worsening. And it is mostly TNF alpha, which is elevated. And TNF alpha goes up within two weeks of starting AT. So that is the reason by intervening it with local, which could be Ozodex, which could be methotrexate. And this one, new one, we have tried is intravitreal anti-TNF, which worked very well for us. The second part of the story is what Dr. Amit is saying, that many a times these are immune driven and you would have 20% of the patients where Despite giving ATT, there would be recurrence. And Soumya Basu has done beautiful work on it about the reinfection and autoinflammation and autoimmunity and how this cascade works. Now, those are the patients who would require a long term suppression even after your ATT stop. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Murray, last, last point from you, and then Just, we'll go to the actually free Actually, I had paper. a question. What was the interval? I'm sorry if I missed it. The methotrexate. And the interval was one week. We gave methotrexate, called the patient after a week. Patients were progressing. Then we went ahead with the dilemma. Aim of repeating methotrexate, actually, we had a choice of repeating intravitreal methotrexate, but we just tried this and then we did not have to re inject. Brilliant case, the brilliant the way it worked. Just last question is apart from methotrexate, could we also have just thought of stepping up the oral steroid at that same point of time? That probably would I think have. Was, if I we do. step up the steroids when the patient came back we with the tried actually the glaucoma or glaucoma clinical kind of because of the steroid responder. Even for the oral steroids they were? The oral they uh, and uh, we wanted uh, to uh, like uh, give IVMP he refused admission or so. Uh, intravitreal was the uh, I think we could have thing. gone up but since this worked so we did. This worked brilliantly. Yeah. Thank you. Not involving the fovea as peripheral, can we be conservative? Because if yes. I yes, we can be conservative. And we have shown that uh, now with optos that we are monitoring, up to 40% of the patients have some form or the other of paradoxical worsening. And out of them, about 20% have them in the periphery. We do not touch those patients. It's only when it is juxtafoveal, approaching or threatening the fovea, that we goes with full guns. Um. I just ask ma'am one, uh, we have a patient whom we are dealing, uh, he's been injected with a PSP steroid elsewhere and uh, uh, in July and similar kind of a condition uh, and uh, the problem is with the glaucoma and he cannot tolerate oral steroids. So one eye he has lost and uh, they're not able to manage the left eye high glaucoma, the steroid is sticking there and uh, he's stable on AKT since six months. Now. How do we go? If he's stable, you don't have to do anything. If he starts showing signs of inflammation coming back, add immunosuppression on long term basis, which would be about two years. That's methotrix. What about the glaucoma part? That Methotrexate or azathioprine do not affect glaucoma. As of now, the tricot is still where we can. You know, you can't do it. If it is PST, there is no way you can remove it. Probably you also pray and ask the patient also to pray not to <laughs> develop glaucoma. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and, and coming that, coming with that, we have the first free paper of the session. Dr. Mamta is going to be speaking to us on subfoveal choroidal thickness changes in an eye of neovascular AMD comparison to fellow eye with non-neovascular AMD. Mamta, please. 
Good afternoon, everyone. As we all know, MD is the leading cause of irreversible uh, blindness, visual impairment among elderly women. Uh, OCT generated macular thickness maps have proven uh, helpful in monitoring progression and response to treatment in anti VGF treatment, and more recently, SD OCT and enhanced depth imaging are being used to examine the choroid of the patients with AMD. So we all know that choroidal thinning has been described in patients with AMD compared to age match controls. However, there has not been a significant investigations regarding the change in the subfloridal thickness of AMD time. So purpose of the study was to uh, Study the subfovial choroidal thickness changes in eye with neovascular AMD in one eye and its fellow eye with non neovascular AMD over time. So, inclusion criteria were all patients diagnosed with neovascular AMD in one eye and non neovascular AMD in the other eye. So, these were the patients treated between April 2020 and May 2022. Exclusion criteria were history of glaucoma. Diabetic retinopathy, CSR, uveitis, trochlear inflammation, and history of intraocular surgery with exception of uncomplicated cataract surgery. So, this is a retrospective single center non randomized observational study done on 40 patients diagnosed with vascular AMD in one eye and non neovascular AMD in the other eye, which was treated by a single retina specialist between April 2020 and May 2022. In this study, 80 eyes of 40 patients were included, with uh, 19 were female, that is 47%, and 52% were male, and the mean age group uh, was 74.4 5 years. Mean follow-up was in plus or minus 11 months. So all patients included in this study underwent a comprehensive ophthalmic examination with fundus biomicroscopy color fundus photos, best corrected visual acuity, and OCT by enhanced depth imaging of Hitchberg's reference tomography. So subfovial choroidal thickness measurement was taken annually by a single researcher uh, at presentation, six months, and a recent follow-up. The measurements were taken from the base of the hyperreflective retinal pigment epithelium to the hyperreflective uh, line corresponding to sclerochoroidal junction. Two measurements were taken at baseline at six months and the recent follow-up and the average data were compared for each patient. So neovascular AMD patients received multiple anti-VGF injections either in PRN or treat and extend regimen to reduce the disease activity. Uh, this is the subfovial choroidal thickness measurement. So what we came across at the baseline was subfovial choroidal thickness was higher at presentation in both the groups, uh, around 196.8 plus or minus 55 in non-neovascular group and 155.5 micrometers plus or minus 38 in AMD group respect. So there was a significant p-value by t-test, paid t-test of 0 0.00182 and as we can see it was non-neovascular AMD. And subfovial thickness reduced time in uh, neovascular AMD groups, uh, 142.75 microns plus or minus 40, who received multiple anti VGF injections over time compared to non neovascular AMD. Was the subfovial choroidal thickness at non neovascular AMD and neovascular AMD at baseline? The subfovial choroidal thickness uh, was also compared uh, in neovascular AMD eyes who received multiple injections from the baseline, which showed a significant reduction in the choroidal thickness with a significant p value of 0 0.01. You can see in the graph. This was the before the injections in a neovascular AMD eye, after the injections. In the non neovascular AMD. A 
according to the literature, we all know that metabolic requirements of the retina for oxygen are very. Right? We come to the crux of you know what you want to say, and then conclusion, please. Thank you. Conclusion: Subfoveal choroidal thick was higher at presentation in both the groups, but was thicker in non-neovascular AMD of the fellow eye. Subfoveal choroidal thickness reduced in eyes with no vascular AMD who received multiple anti-VGF injections and remained same in non-neovascular AMD, except for those with ge geographic atrophy. So it's very unclear whether it was because uh, subfoveal thickness reduction is because of the natural history of AMD or uh, related to anti-VGF treatment. So here it is a small, small size study and it is a retrospective study. So we need a lot of data and uh, advanced technology is available to check for the choroidal segmentation and uh, to understand these changes in the choroid process related to age related macular DJ. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I get, uh, can I please ask Atul to be here for, for the last paper and then we can have the discussion please. Uh, just one quick question ma'am. Uh, what would you say is the normal range of the subfoveal choroidal thickness in Indian eyes aged emetropes? Uh, below 300 is like not. Oh, so in one of your slides, if I can point out, yes, it, it said 155 and you said that was that was abnormally increased. Compared, is compared, no sir, I didn't, uh, I didn't tell about the comparative between Chaya. That was the it difference was between. Difference yes. between that. My bad, then That's I, I had a, the issue with. That uh, Dr. Ali, your uh, your take on that, and uh, any response to, uh, and if I can just pose one question to you before we go to Atul's uh, free paper, ma'am. You say that this is this could be a biomarker. Can you so new vascular AMD one eye and non new vascular AMD other eye? We all know this pretty high rise you know, chance of the other eye getting involved. New yes, vascular sir. process happening. Will do you think, on your experience in your study, that the subfoveal choroidal thickness could help you maybe predict if that eye is going to get not, you know new vascular AMD? Definitely, and maybe your uh, follow-up can you know then all be yes, altered sir. based on that. Based on the best corrected visual acuity was even lesser. We can predict whether the other eye, based on both eyes, if the thickness is reducing, then we can definitely measure whether which eye is going to have a better prognosis based on the thickness comparatively. The thicker choroids will have a. Fair enough. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, we're going to come to, uh, I think, the last free paper of the session. Dr. Atul's back with us, and he's going to be talking about retinal vascularity index, affected and fellow eyes of patients with branch retinal vein occlusion using a purpose built semi automated software, a case control study. Dr. Atul, please. All know, I so to look at the Systemic status of our health. Fundus examination allow, gives us the opportunity to get the blood vessels in vivo. Way back in 1870, I first observed nar narrowing of nar retinal arterial hypertensive patients. Subsequently, on clinical findings, Eisner came up with the, the classification of hypertensive retinopathy. Wong Mitchell correlated the clinical findings with systemic mortality. Arteriovenous ratio or AVR is a widely used and common entity to assess the, retinal, uh, the health of retinal vasculature. However, if we go back to preliminary report, you can see the reports giving the AVR ratio ranging from 2 is 5 is to 5. This was because of the discrepancy of the, uh, in the method to, uh, of measuring AVR, like the same vessels of the same caliber were not taken. So to, to standardize, the traditional clinical practice has been to, uh, in the peripapillary region and calculate AV ratio that, that is used as a global AVR that we use in our clinical practice. However, this AV ratio may vary different quadrants of same eye as evidenced by uh, the evaluation of large number of 200 patients back. Nevertheless, the global AVR the methodology to observe clinically remain the same, and it has been associated. AV ratio has been associated with systemic comorbidities. Global AVR continues. However, a very classic example of regional AV changes or AVR is BRVO. Here we look at the regional changes responsible for the sector of involvement of vein occlusion. 
problems with global AVR currently are the subjectivity and it's a global method and it ignores the re coming to our study we the semi automated purpose built uh, software calculate AV ratio that we labeled as retinal vascularity index in patients with ARVO the fellow eyes and compared this ratio with the age matched healthy controls this was a cross sectional study and uh, images with set protocol and uh, funder centered were taken and used for this purpose this pictogram you, uh, uh, depicts that the we calculated AV ratio in different senses from the disc starting from half disc diameter 1, 1.52 and in different quadrants I'll be showing a brief video how we go about this is a freely available software for the image one has to manually market the disc and the phobia save this it appears observer or the reader markets uh, the arteries and software automatically calculates the of artery and vein and gives the AV so but at the end we have this long table about stats coming to results so we uh, analyzed 420 eyes 140 B uh, patients of BRVO and 140 health 420 because we analyzed fellow eyes as well it was 50 years now let us look at this table firstly uh, talking about the global AVR you can see that the patients with BRVO had significantly reduced in all quadrants globally as compared to healthy controls and interestingly the fellow eyes also had reduced as compared now, this is a busy table let us quickly go through it here we can see that the uh, AV ratio temporal and ferrotemporal quadrants much more reduced as compared to healthy controls the which needs this goes by our clinical correlation that BRVO effect affects temporal quadrants to summarize affected and fellow eyes of BRVO reduction in AV ratio compared to healthy controls however rather than going for global AVR to look at the regional changes and compare the regional AVR uh, to be more informative and innovative purpose built semi automated software can bring in objectivity in this effort and the implications are these can be used make a deep learning algorithm software or so on predict risks for BRVO and assess system well I think great work I can say I think you should have submitted this for the hack the tech session that was or something which was uh, which was new uh, so uh, uh, good on you for that uh, I'm bring this open to all the panelists the vice council if they have any uh, you know inputs or any their take on this and that this could be as he said uh, the, you know very fertile ground for actually standardizing uh, AI you know kind of uh, and using this for uh, you know AI based uh, action or high risk of branch retinal vein occlusion occurring in the fellow eye or maybe high risk patients otherwise I think it's the last point in it. When you correlate with the systemic uh, manifestation, that would give us a very good clue uh, how to go about in preventing this from happening. We all know it's more to the temporal segments than you know what particular pathology is just hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterol, uh, hyperomal, maybe a multifactorial cross section analysis. A better knowledge mention part. And if I were to ask Atul, how long does it take, let's say, uh, you know, manually to, uh, you know, kind of get it all done for one patient? Well, from uploading to uh, to like marking boundaries and all, take uh, five minutes or so. It's a learning curve, but once you acquire that, uh, what needs to be done, so it's under five minutes for a for both the eyes or for a single image. For, for a single five image. For fair enough, fair enough. Please. Well, great work. Just one question. Have you thought of trying it in other diseases also like SLE or something where we see vessel changes and probably help in understanding the pathogenesis, how they evolve? Thinking of applying it to other diseases also? Yes, sir. This uh, software is in very nascent stage. We are currently analyzing the patients with hypertension vis a vis healthy control. And the other disease the potential areas could be Takayas, arthritis, or so. We are going to explore in, on that front.
just validating the software. We don't have a huge normative data right now. So the first step will be to validate its reproducibility, which we found it was working fine. Now the normative data and then of course vasculitis. It and the retinal health eventually. Thank you. Thank you. And before we uh, wind up, just a quick recap of thank you, Atul, uh, of what uh, we learned from the Wise Council and the active participation from the audience. I think if we were to, you know, uh, discuss about uveitic glaucoma, I think the two, three points that were brought out very well today were that um, akin to uveitic cataract, I think metabolic, uh, I, I, I think systemic control, control of inflammation, very, very important. And you try and tide over the acute IOP rise with, you know, with medications. Um, uh, and a threshold for ruling out viruses in the entire segment, especially if there's high IOP, vented KPs, if your cornea is becoming too bad too soon, secular count is low, along with your usual other you know, iris uh, abnormalities, atrophy and all, should be low, the threshold for suspecting. And once, if you're suspecting, irrespective of the stage of treatment, the patient's not on antivirals. I think getting the aqueous out for polymerase chain reaction testing can make the difference between actually success and failure. Uh, regarding, I, I think the maximum discussion, and I think what, what would also be uh, most relevant for a largely retina practicing uh, audience was on the ARN and CMV retinitis related retinal detachments. I think two, three things. Uh, so, uh, so a buckle may not always be necessary. Uh, you know, was something that came out. Uh, I think the threshold for uh, you know leaving membranes behind and doing like a minimal, uh, you know, what you might do in some diabetics. Is, is very, very low. So you, you should try and get as much out in these eyes. Large posterior retinectomy should be avoided. Try and laser as much as you can. Because of course, uh, you know, the, the, you have chances with hypotony, increased uh, uveoscleral outflow. Choice of tamponade should be oil and based on HIV status or not, MV on or, and or the fellow eye, a 5,000 centistroke might be preferred if you feel that the systemic status uh, would not allow you to, uh, you know, kind of remove the uh, oil in due course of time. Uh, regarding the, uh, the, you know, management of, I think one important question was asked regarding cystoid macular edema, either in healed on or treated on retinal detachment with all other things, retinitis being quiet, how to treat it. Uh, I think there was a, a little bit of a division in the house. But for the most part, I think treatment with non-steroidal topical anti-inflammatories is the way to go. And uh, if you can have a qualified discussion with the patient and if the patient can kind of learn to live with that, uh, I think steroids should be I won't say absolutely contraindicated, but contraindicated to as much of a degree as possible. And if needed, I think posterior subtenon should definitely be avoided. And one can look at a sustained release intraocular uh, injection, but with a huge pinch of salt um, if one needs to go down that road. Uh, regarding the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the two cases on tubercular serpiginous like choroditis paradoxical worsening, I think uh, so, so, so local therapy typically would happen if it happens in one eye, and if there's an indi you know, uh, indication to treat, if it's not involving the periphery, if it's disc or macula threatening, then you would want to treat treat aggressively. If it's with local therapy, then of course you would uh, prefer steroids, either triamcin alone on or Ozodex. If steroids, for whatever reason, locally are contraindicated, then methotrexate, and and has been shown. Um, uh, you know, excellently in that case, at a, at a, at a limumab, and if I may say so, uh, drawing from the experience of uh, lymphoma, maybe even rituximab uh, might be an option, depending on the variability and cost and you know, all of those factors. Systemic increase in immunosuppression in bilateral cases, or if that happens later on with reactivations, I think is something that needs to be done, and then those immunosuppressants need to continue for a pretty long time. Um, and regarding, I think there's also one last question, then we'll wrap up. Regarding the... <clears throat> Uh, the laser in occlusive retinal vasculitis, you do angiograms, but there is no evidence of NVD, NVE, but there are lots of capillary non perfusion areas. I think, uh, uh, I think it's a no-brainer that if the eye is inflamed, if there's an aqueous or vitreous reaction, and you do an angiogram with active vasculitis, also a lot of uh, ischemia, you would want to do laser, but it will not be in that setting. The setting of acute inflammation will start the patient on steroids and whatever else treatment you want to give for the uh, vasculitis and down the line, uh, you know, let's say two to three to four weeks, maybe six weeks down the line, inflammation is controlled, then you might consider lasering. Uh, the issue and which was brought out in the case that ma'am presented was in the absence of inflammation in that eye, but a systemic disease with the inflamed fellow eye, um, uh, you know, you might land up with a very acute exacerbation of inflammation, like we had hypopion uveitis following um, uh, laser. So, 
um, uh, you know, uh, I think I think the jury on that is still out. Whether you would want to in vasculitis patients, absence of inflammation, no NVD, NVE, really want to go all guns blazing at the get go or kind of stagger it a bit. I think that case told us to stagger it a bit, but uh, some of the uh, the vice actually said that their experience has been that for the most part they were to laser uh, you know in one go they have not seen so, so the house was divided on that uh, and thank you i'd like to thank the vice council and vrsi i think we've finished on time uh, it's time for lunch